Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Explode Your Expert Business Show. And today I'm here with the one and only Rachel Patterson. Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the show. As I mentioned before, I've been following you for four and a half, five years. Love your stuff. And when you said, yes, I would love to be on the show, I was like, yes, yes, that made my day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I couldn't wait to have you on. And so we are going to talk about all the things social media. I mean, you are a social media queen. Uh, you live and breathe social media every single day on multiple platforms. <laughs> like uh, I see you now look around your different profile. There is not one platform that you have not mastered yet. Uh, in the one that I'm, that are most commonly shared in our industry. Um, but before we go there, I have a question for you. Okay. you. So I was doing some bit of research and you met and married your husband in 13 days. Yes, that is. Okay. Correct. Now, so before we talk social media, to get, <laughs> let me run my hand around it. First. <laughs> and then we can talk about social media. <laughs> yes. So the interesting thing, and I want to give this backstory because today, if one of my kids said, I just met the man of my dreams and we're going to get married, I'd be like, didn't you watch Frozen? Like that can end really badly. But the interesting thing about my husband and I meeting is I was already a single mom, which a lot of people are like, well, isn't that more of a sign that you should probably wait a little bit before getting married? But there was just this instant confidence. I felt like I saw it. I don't even know how to explain it, but I felt like in the instant that he like kissed my wrist, I saw our future together and I didn't know how to explain it, but I had dated quite a bit. I had been engaged several times um, and I was a mom of a three-year-old at that point. Now to give a little backstory, I already knew he wasn't like a psychopath because I was actually um, babies, like my, I was babysat growing up by his cousin. So we were in the same circle and I was set up with him by his sister-in-law, who's now my sister-in-law, and we were close friends. And she said, you've right. got to meet Paul. And so there was like, at least the trust factor a little bit behind the scenes, but I just knew uh, this is the person I want to be with. And when we told our friends and family that we wanted to get married in six months, everyone freaked out. And I was like, they had, you know they had their reasons. Fair enough. They had their I reasons. <laughs> <now. laughs> I can't blame them. <laughs> But in that moment, I was like, if everyone's going to be mad anyways, why don't we just get married tomorrow? And he's like, let's do it. So we went down to uh, the Chapel of Love at the Mall of America and got married 13 days after we met. Wow, that, that's insane. I mean, I'm Italian. Yes. I'm a hopeless romantic. Um, <laughs> so it's like when, when I read this on your, on your profile, I was like, no, I can't, I can't <laughs> believe that. <laughs> It's crazy. It's All crazy. right. So l l let's look at the social media side. It's been a, a love at first sight also with the social media world. It's like met social media in 13 days and fell in love. And, uh, oh my or... God. <laughs> I, it's, I, yeah, actually, as crazy as that sounds, social media has always had a really romantically special place in my heart. And I mean, literally, I've romanticized social media. And part of the reason for that is because, so I don't open up a lot about my backstory yet, uh, portions of it, but I grew up in a kind of rough household and I love my parents to pieces, but it was a very toxic environment. And so I oftentimes would turn to social media as an escape. So I remember at 13 years old, and even maybe a little younger, hopping onto MySpace, learning how to code, creating the best profile I could. For me, social media was an escape and it was a place I could connect with my friends. Um, it, it, was, it was a really positive thing for my life. And then when I, was, uh, when I became a single mom at 21 years old, we were you know on welfare and food stamps and i would like sit at night watching reality shows on netflix because that was all that was available on netflix at that point in time and i'd watch these reality shows and i started tweeting to reality stars just to see what would happen and they started replying and i was like oh my gosh this is crazy and one day one of the uh the producers of a show that i <laughs> love the bachelor she actually mm -hmm. followed me and we started connecting over social media for several years which was crazy and rooting for each other and in that moment social media felt like a portal to a different possibility that i didn't see as a possibility at that point in time wow and what what is social media for you now 
Mm. <laughs> it's my creative outlet. I love social media. I love that I get to learn from people of all different walks. Uh, I love that I get to see so many, as crazy as it sounds, because some people uh, can get really cranky on social, but I still at the same time love really? not. <laughs> yeah, especially this year. I love being able to see different people's experiences and vantage points and learning about things that I wouldn't have thought of before and connecting with people that, you know, live across the globe. I mean, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. Would, I mean, would we have met in person potentially when I went to Italy in April, but that obviously didn't happen this year because we had to cancel the trip. Maybe it would have happened, but social media allowed even this to happen and for us to connect. So for me, it is an ability to connect with others. It's a place to amplify a message that you believe in. And it's a place to honestly create and document the process of change and growth. Uh, uh, what would you say to people that uh, 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 we have uh, in our clients base uh, a split and uh, probably mm -hmm. you've experienced this people that love social media is like oh my god social media is the best thing you can connect with everyone you can find clients you can it's a creative outlet and then you have other people that as soon as you mention the word social media then you can see them becoming ghosts like their face becomes super pale <laughs> they start fainting so uh what would you say to someone that feels like that about social media you know social media can be intimidating and i want to give credit to people for even considering it as a possibility uh if i were to say tomorrow do you want a billboard in t new york city times square a lot of people would be like I don't know what to put on it. And I think that that's that same fear when you approach social media. What am I going to say? Are people going to listen? And there's almost a split. This is one of my favorite splits. There's the fear of what if people see it and disagree? And what if nobody sees it at all? So how can both be present at the same time? It's very interesting. I think sometimes the fear of social media is more of the fear of putting one's voice out there with the possibility of criticism or no one reacting or what if it works and people love it and agree and suddenly you've built a platform and now there's the responsibility of that. So social media isn't just a, isn't just a place to type something. Does that make sense? It's yeah, not just yeah. a platform. There's a lot of other meaning that can be attached to social. So I understand that the decision is more complicated than just should I create a profile? Did you have any moment uh, where, you know, like you started with a love and a passion of social media was your, was your creative outlet, it represented the, the vision of a different future for you. Um, is there any negative uh, uh, thing that happened to you uh, because of social media? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. There is uh, a dark side to social media, just like there is to advertising uh, on TV or in a magazine or the magazine industry, there's always a dark side to anything that has really great opportunity to. So for example, social media can be really taxing on mental health if you aren't careful. Um, I had to learn this the hard way. It was actually a month ago or maybe a little less, about a month ago that my husband said, you know, Rachel, you're starting to spend a lot of time on social media in the evenings and on the weekends when you're not supposed to be working. Mm -hmm. And he was like, what do you think about that? And he's very slow to like share what he thinks about that kind of stuff. But he, he posed it as a question, but it was like, oh shoot, you're right. So I went and got two different phones. This one is my phone for evenings and weekends, only texting and calls with family. And then, you know, like Kindle books and uh, uh, Duolingo so I can learn French. And this one is where all my social media is. And the beautiful thing is I'm not opening social media or emails on the other phone. This yeah. stays in my office now. So when I'm done working, I can't even get to my phone. And that's an intentional disconnect to keep me off of social without having to make a, an intentional choice. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really helpful. I will say one other thing too. Anytime that people are behind keyboards, there is a lot of possibility for beauty and good and awesome support. And there's also a possibility for people to say some very cruel and hurtful things. Mm -hmm. And since I've built as a personal brand, it's never like, oh, I hate their logo. It's like, oh, I hate her face. And so it becomes very personal. Um, and so I had to spend a lot of time 
navigating how to deal with comments. And I would say the greatest breakthrough for me on that was reading this book called The Anatomy of Peace by the Harbinger Institute mm -hmm. and understanding how to have eyes that see what people's actions are actually saying. That's a, a very powerful um, uh, thing that you said right now, Thank because you. it's easy to get caught up uh, into attaching that comment to your identity. Yeah. Because oh at the God. end of the day, like, we are sharing things on social media. I'm very active on social media. I build my businesses through social media. And, um, you know, there is that moment where whether you want, you want to admit it to yourself or not, you're looking for the approval because uh, whatever we put out is for others. I mean, yeah. I don't put out, I don't spend two hours a day creating content just because I got nothing else to do, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is because I want to add value to people's life through different media and through what I know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you get that comment, and I, I think, uh, I don't know if you want to share, I know something happened to you recently um, when you posted a, a, a picture um, recently, I uh, saw so your yeah. post on social media, if you want to expand on that. For sure. Absolutely. So I, I had my first real experience with like trolls and haters. And I mean, when I say that, I don't mean like an occasional comment. I mean like a volume of it back in 2016, when my husband's and I, our love story went viral and there was actually a local paper here in the cities, um, in Minnesota that they created an entire article tearing me apart and I was I, I, I was tagged on it on social media and I opened it and I was not prepared for it and that really shocked me and I that was when I realized I think it's time to start developing some skills to have a, a thicker skin be some uh, tools and layers in place to protect me from having to read all the comments uh, like a team that supports me and just passes along the best feedback or feedback that's necessary. Sometimes criticism is actually a good thing. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I posted um, a photo on my Instagram and it was of my postpartum belly because not all mom's stomachs spring right back. And I was one of those that had huge babies. And so my stomach looks like, uh, for lack of better words, like a raisin sitting there on my, on my skin. And so I posted this picture and I was really nervous about it. I was like, okay, I'm going to put this out there. And surprisingly, we had an incredible we had incredible feedback, um, but I wasn't checking the comments. That was really important to me. It was about me putting it out there and overcoming my own fear, not mm -hmm. about the approval and, and uh, people pleasing in that moment. Yep. So I put it out there, avoided the comments. My team handled the comments, which is awesome as I'm dealing with my own acceptance of my body. And I go on TikTok one day and I'm tagged in a video. And so someone created uh, this video, I want to say it was a woman who was in her mid fifties, possibly. And she said, you know, basically Rachel Peterson, um, I saw your, your po post about your stomach and listen, I'm a mom, but no one wants to see your jiggly belly on social media. It is sad. It is seriously sad. And she goes on to rant about how pathetic <laughs> I, I was in that post and how I was obviously seeking attention. But truth be told, I didn't put that post up for anyone else. I put that post up because I wish that I had seen that there were stomachs like that when I woke up at 21 one day with that stomach after having a baby and realized, oh my gosh, my stomach has changed forever. And so that, that video the fact that I was tagged and the fact that I didn't see it coming and there wasn't a warning like, hey, I'm going to try to, you know, sucker punch you. That one hurt and it hit me and kind of stung for a couple of days. And then I had to like go through a little bit of a healing and recognizing where she was at. And then I faced it. And what's crazy is like the response to it went viral, which was pretty fun. But also at the same time, I'm willing to take some of those hate comments to allow and help others to feel more comfortable in their own skin as yeah. I am on the journey of getting to that place. It's almost like the moment we give uh, ourselves permission to be okay with who we are and to be okay with what we want to share. And uh, uh, I know that in your case, uh, it, as you mentioned, it wasn't to share just for to showcase, like uh, there was a message for mm -hmm. other people that felt the same way where you felt in which when you found yourself in that situation. And, um, uh, 
when we have this intention, then of course we don't know. We never know who is going to interact, who is going to respond. Sometimes some of the people that are I had experiences with people that are close, that were closest to me, uh, mm -hmm. that wanted to tear me apart, and it hurts. It hurts like hell. But at the same time, do you have the other part, which is uh, you know that with that action you're giving permission to other maybe few hundreds depending on your following but sometimes can be thousands or hundreds or thousands or millions depending on the reach to mm -hmm. then be who they are and be comfortable in their skin yeah. and i think that the, uh, i wanted before talking about strategies i wanted to have a conversation with you around this because i know you're very uh, open about uh, um actually not just using social media as a platform to attract client, but using social media as actually a platform to inspire others, to make a difference, to make an impact. And now that we have dealt with this part, which is very relevant now, it became a bit more mainstream with the movie, uh, with the documentary, The Social Dilemma, mm -hmm. where a lot of more people that we are outside the social media world started waking up also to this truth and what's going yeah. on and the impact that you know, young people have, uh, that will have on young people uh, because they don't have the filter or the, some, <laughs> that uh, as adults we might have. <laughs> A lot of I, adults don't have those filters in themselves, so. <laughs> yes, I will say like with our kids, you know, we've got a 10 year old, she's getting close to the age where she's gonna wanna be on social media and having experienced the darkest underbellies of social, I laugh when I say that because it's like, it's bad sometimes. Mm. Um, I tough because I know how powerful social media was for me and how much it shaped not just who I became, but also my career and my passion and everything. So I think the biggest thing that I want for my kids with social is I want them to not see the comments. I want them to create regardless of what other people are saying. I don't think that those comments are helpful until their prefrontal cortex is fully formed. And I don't want comments to be a part of shaping their decision making of what is right and what is wrong. I want them to kind of go on that journey and then continue to grow once that part of their identity is a little more uh, in place, if that makes sense. That's a very good piece of advice because I've been thinking, it's like, okay, so yeah. it's great to talking about, uh, we need to protect uh, yeah, children from social media and the, the, the negative part of social media, but mm -hmm. I never ex found a way as I, practically, how can you do that other than saying, give me your phone or you don't have a phone <laughs> up until you are 25, <laughs> which is not going to happen anyway. So. Right. I love that we're having this discussion because like I think about, so Dakota, our 10 year old, one day she right. came home from school and she said, you know, my friends, or I, I saw this dance on TikTok and I was like, hold on. <laughs> How did you see a dance on TikTok? Like, let's just talk about this because TikTok has a lot of crazy and TikTok has a lot of variety of viewpoints and mm -hmm. um, levels of appropriateness. And I realized suddenly that my kids are going to see it, if that makes sense. Even if it's, if I don't give them a phone, they're going to see it on their friend's phone. So one of the best things I can do is open up the lines of communication and say, let's talk about it. Like, here are some of the things you may see hey, here's a heads up. This is what this song means. So if you do it, you have to know what the meaning is so that maybe you think twice about it. Or, hey, is this something you want your future love to see? Yeah. And so I want to like actually have those crazy conversations and then ultimately accept what my kids decide to do with some guidance for safety. Sure. But at the same time, they're going to do it. The biggest thing that we need to do as parents, though, I believe, at least this is my stance, is to empower them to know what questions to be asking and what things mean. Hmm. That's a very powerful way to end, uh, to end this segment. I think it will leave a lot of people <laughs> something to think about. And uh, um, for me in particular, I mean, I don't have kids yet, but uh, I'm... Uh, I just love children. I've been working with, with, with children, young people since, since I was 15. Um, and uh, that has been, a, that's my first business was going in schools and delivering courses and training for kids. So it's a big passion that I have. And it just hurts to see how many people can associate their sense of worth with the numbers of likes that they get or the comments that they receive. So now let's move on, on to the business side. Uh, so because social media now, we explored a bit more the dark side, what can happen. But then on the other way, 
yo, I wouldn't be here without social media. So mwah, go bless social media. <laughs> right. <laughs> do, same for you. So uh, what do you see that is working right now um, during social, like in the social media world? If you're looking, first of all, like on a um, macro level, and then we can go specific in different platforms, but on a macro level, what do you see is working right now? Okay, so this is going to be upsetting in a good way. Um, <laughs> All right, let's, let's drop the interview. That's the- <laughs> well, when I first started in social media, I listened to two major people, and those were uh, Seth Godin and Gary Vaynerchuk. And I listened to them quite a bit, and they were saying things that at that time felt very fluffy because it was like, be consistent, give value, uh, be authentic put out good content. And like, they would just say those things and I would always get like so frustrated. And I, I got discontent with that message and I started looking for growth hackers and people who knew how to do everything faster. And like, I was looking for the easy button essentially. And I stopped listening to Gary Vaynerchuk and I stopped listening to Seth Godin. And I was like, no, like give me like tactical ways to grow and explode overnight. And after, it's almost been six years since I started my business while still in my nine to five, I can very, very confidently say that Seth Godin and Gary Vaynerchuk were spot on. It is all about consistency and it's all about finding your authentic voice. And if something isn't working, keep tweaking until you find what does. Uh, Study patterns. And I don't mean study the patterns of just random people. I mean, study the patterns of what's working on each platform and find ways to take those patterns to other platforms. So I spend most of my day researching and studying uh, patterns. And then I actually do create all of my own content because uh, this is actually my passion. (laughs) So if I did nothing else all day, I would just create content for seven, eight hours. It's actually my favorite part of it. So it's easy for me to speak about this, but put out good content, put some real effort into making sure that what you're creating is really serving someone else. I remember I saw this piece of content and this to me was the epitome of just creating content. Someone was helping with like healthy eating on TikTok Mm -hmm. for kids. And she said, great, uh, healthy eating tip for parents. Instead of giving your kids chips, give them carrots. And I was like, oh gosh, like, what carrots i never thought about that but i was like that's the exact epitome of just putting out content not putting out good content that actually creates a paradigm shift for your followers and so Mm -hmm. i'm back to listening to a lot more of gary vaynerchuk and seth godin these days and i'm like day gone it i spent so many years searching for the easy button the fast viral hacks and now we go viral Uh, almost every single day, especially with TikTok, um, we get millions of views per day across all our platforms. And I'm like, it is all about consistency, good value, and asking yourself, how can I serve my audience before you are served personally? Uh, And for those uh, people that say, well, okay, Rachel, that's that's awesome. You are, you love creating content, but I hate it. I can uh, I sit down five minutes and uh, after a few minutes, I just want to give up. That's not my thing. Uh, what would you say in that situation, knowing that content is crucial for like any business online right now? Absolutely. So there's two different ways that we can look at it. Number one, if you hate creating content, the question to ask is, then what other method are you going to use to reach your people? because there has to be a way. So if you want to, let's say, rent out radio station commercials, that's fine, that totally counts. If you wanna put out full page ads in magazines, wonderful. This may get you by without having to create content, but there's a faster, more effective, uh, very easily leveraged method of creating content online. And so if you're not going to do something else, (laughs) <laughs> with the other types of older school uh, mediums, you have to find a way to make content work for you. And so, for example, like a lot of times people will say, I don't want to get into shape uh, because I hate burpees. And you know what? Me too. I hate burpees. I would love to never do a burpee in my life. And you know what? I don't. I find other ways of getting fitness, even though every personal trainer swears by burpees. I'd rather 
run. I'd rather dance. I'd rather jump in place for 30 minutes. Like you can find different ways to create content, whether it's sitting down and talking with someone, recording the conversation, mm -hmm. hiring someone to turn that into content, whether it's taking your live events where you're in person with people connecting and then having someone taking notes for creating the content. Yep. Uh, there are so many different ways that you can create content. So you don't, you can't just say like, Oh, I hate creating content. All of it. You hate talking and you hate writing and you hate design and you hate like, no, there's chances are there's a way that you just haven't thought of to create content. Uh, I agree with you. Totally agree with you. Uh, and I think it's more um, about that person finding what is uh, the way in which you excel at creating content or what is the way, the things that you love doing. Uh, if you prefer talking, do more videos. No, if, or do podcasts if you don't want to show your face, uh, if you're not comfortable enough for that while you're building that skill. Uh, if, you are, uh, if, you, if you like writing, focus on writing. Yes. If, you, if you like speaking and as you mentioned, getting you recorded, then, then do it. And I gotta say, like, for me, that, that's why I love podcasts. Uh, are two favorite ways that I love creating content is by talking because no one can shut me up. I love talking. <laughs> that was like, this is cool. And now I get paid for it. Brilliant. Uh, and uh, the other way is uh, to do interviews because I love having con great conversations with people that I want to learn from and that uh, I respect and uh, I, 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 can, I, I can have an interaction with. I can have a meaningful conversation. And that creates the content. So uh, it is about everyone thinking, okay, you're listening to this show what is the, what will your starting point be uh, on, on the content creation? Like I write because like I'm now outsourcing a lot of part of my writing. I hate writing. I've done it because it was a necessity. Now I'm happy I don't have to do it anymore or I just do what I can. But, <laughs> yes. but it is, uh, everyone has their own, uh, their own way. So um, which, which one is your favorite platform, social media platform? Because uh, you're, on YouTube, you're on, Instagram, you're on Facebook, you're on TikTok, you are on LinkedIn. Um, which one is your favorite? Okay, so I have a personal favorite and I have a business favorite. Uh, and I'm not going to reveal which is which, <laughs> but I have two favorite platforms. If I had to rebuild all over again, I would just build on these two platforms. Um, TikTok and YouTube. And here's why I'm in love with these two platforms. First and foremost, TikTok is fast. For example, it took me five minutes to record a video earlier today, right before this actually podcast. And let's see how many views it has, because this is just powerful. Uh, 33,000 views since this uh, episode started recording. And I'm getting between 500,000 and 2 million video views per day, whether it's business advice or personal branding. That means you guys, this is so crazy to me. Um, we're averaging 1 million video views per day. People seeing my face a million times. That's like a billboard in Times that's, that's Square. That's all right. That's all right. It's pretty <laughs> decent. Uh, but I also love YouTube. And what I love most about YouTube is it's not a short term um, platform. And so what I love about it is knowing that if I want to slog it out for several years, most of my competition will give up early because there is no fast reward on like on, on YouTube. And I love that. So for example, one year ago, I had 4,400 subscribers. I had been on YouTube for, oh my gosh, four and a half, five years before uh, last fall. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, six years later, over... So one year ago, we had 4,400 subscribers on YouTube after four and a half, five years of slogging it out. And now magically overnight, we're at 52,000 subscribers one year later, getting 300,000 to 600,000 video views per month. And people saying like, genuinely, thank you so much for this. Your videos have helped me grow my business. Your videos have helped me go viral. Uh, you know, build up our, our customer base. And so I love YouTube and most people will sleep on it because it's a lot of work and very little thanks for a lot longer than you assume. And so that's like my secret weapon is YouTube. 
talking about delayed gratification. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you, you mentioned, you know, YouTube, uh, I can get my head around YouTube. A lot of people can. It has been around for a while. It's more secure. And uh, um, for people, for someone who is consistent, loves to create video content, awesome platform. Now you're talking about TikTok, and I know you are going all in right now on TikTok. Uh, but a lot of business owners will argue, well, but my audience is not there. So why should I uh, spend time on TikTok where still the audience that I want to attract now for my business, they can understand, okay, I can understand the concept that one day they will grow up, but I don't want any clients now. I don't need clients in 15 years when, they can have a, when I can have a debit card or a credit card. So uh, what's your take on that? Well, I just spoke with TikTok corporate not too long ago and got the most recent stats from TikTok directly. Um, right now, there is about 805 million monthly active users on TikTok, excluding China. So outside of China, almost, well, getting close to a billion monthly active users. Now, here's the part that blows most people's minds. Between 26 and 31% of those 805 million monthly active users are over the age of 30. Now, I'm not a mathematician or a genius by any means, but that's a lot of people over the age of 30. Uh, and mm -hmm. that was when I started creating content specifically for parents, moms, people over 30, making inside jokes about being an 80s baby or a 90s kid. When you start making those types of TikToks, you realize very quickly, oh my gosh, there are so many other adults here hanging out on TikTok. It's a prime opportunity. Uh, the crazy thing for me, um, one year ago, I had about 12,000 followers on TikTok. Today, I have 432,000 followers on TikTok, which still blows my mind a little bit. Um, I have nice. It's crazy. <laughs> um, and yet, we believe that within the next six months, I'll be over 1 million followers based on our current growth rates. Um, I have celebrities who follow me, American Express, partnered up with me because they found me on TikTok and paid me to teach their business owners. So there's tons of opportunity on TikTok. The only thing is that's crazy is most of your competitors don't believe it. Your, comp uh, your competitors are as skeptical as you are about mm -hmm. TikTok. And for that reason, there's a blue open ocean for, let's say, about one more year, potentially two years, but really only about one more year. So I am going to make a goal of over the next one to two years, getting to 5 million followers on TikTok and using that to absolutely catapult the rest of my presence of, online. Of the other, of the other platforms. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, using, yeah, as a, is the early adopter concept uh, of uh, going to a platform when is early and then use that to grow the others and i'm glad we covered that and so uh, let's <laughs> let's open up the q a uh with um we, we got mercy and and caroline i know mercy you're ready at a question so if you want to mute yourself mercy uh please go ahead and ask and ask your question i know you already wrote it down but hi um my question is i have i have a son he's a photographer and um his stuff goes viral okay. uh, sorry you mercy know, i cannot up. Um, the, your voice is cracking up, so, now? yeah, no, I can't hear you. Your voice is cracking up. So, because okay, we are part of the recording, yeah, I'm going to read it for you, uh, which one of the questions was, uh, okay, I know it might be a long answer, but you can start giving the first part of the answer. How do you monetize TikTok? Good question. How do you monetize a billboard in the New York Times? You place, <laughs> if someone gave you a billboard in, New York, uh, in the Times Square, you'd be like, yes, I'll figure out how to monetize later. Truth be told, if we just come at it from a branding standpoint, that alone is absolutely worth it. Having potentially a million video views per day, and I have people that I've worked with who are getting two to 10 million video views per day of their face opens up huge opportunities in the mm -hmm. future just from the brand recognition alone. Yeah. Now, I personally use several different uh, very conventional in business methods of monetization. I don't use like they do pay popular creators for their views. I don't use that because that's just not worth it to me. If that makes sense, I'd rather 
leverage my own ability to monetize. I personally bring people first and foremost to other platforms, but also directly to my email list. You can have a link in your bio. I'll do an awesome video and then say, hey, basically guys, like go check out the link in my bio if you wanna grab that free resource. So since joining, um, TikTok, it's not 100% attributed to TikTok, but we've grown our email list from, it used to be about like 35,000 a year ago. We're at 110,000 one That's year huge, later, which is- a huge growth. It's exponential growth. That's not normal. And so I have to say- Unless, you, <laughs> unless you do a big launch with paid ads and, jo and JVs and so on. I, I haven't know. done really any JVs. Yeah, yeah. I haven't done a big launch, anything like that. So a lot of this has to do with um, TikTok. I don't actually pitch on TikTok because I'm actually not a big believer in pitching on any social media platform. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in having outside conversion mechanisms, whether yeah. it's a webinar or uh, a, a specific launch that people are brought to, uh, or even an email that sells. I am not a believer in selling directly on any platform. Um, very often, once in a while, I will. Um, but once in a while, I'll do a direct response. Hey, if you wanna learn directly from me, if you wanna work directly with me, if you wanna hire me, uh, I have several openings, go ahead and check it out. The link in my bio is available for you. And guess mm -hmm. what, we get tons of applications. We've made um, almost six figures worth of sales in just 2020. We're about to cross six figures worth of sales directly from TikTok with no uh, cost of advertising. That's really good, which now we get to the other question from Mercy and then Caroline, I'm going to go back to you, which is uh, more for her son. In fact, uh, my son is 20 years old and is a photographer and gets 150,000 views on his videos. How can he build this to monetize? So then in this case, it will be like for a photographer, what would you suggest? Oh, I would absolutely build an email list because you have no idea how that's going to evolve over time. But that being said, like I've found photographers on TikTok, so encourage him to grow significantly, like make an active effort towards growth. Cause I personally like to hire um, talent from TikTok, even if it's in another country or even if it's in another state, because I get a chance to see the behind the scenes and who they are and their personality mm -hmm. and their work across multiple different shoots or opportunities. So even if he doesn't directly monetize immediately and Right now, as we record this, it is a weird time in the world, but let's say one year from now, he has a following of several hundred thousand people. His opportunities are going to be much greater. And that doesn't even include the opportunities for like sponsorships and JVs and partnerships and the celebrities that may find him. There are a lot of celebrities hanging out and actually spending time on TikTok. All right. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, do you want to mute yourself for your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been really interesting. And I, I've got some questions about um, the plat you know, different platforms and how much traction you can get on them. So I think one of my, well, the main um, place that I put my, my content is on LinkedIn, because that's where I believe my audience are. So I, I'm sort of trying to work with senior leaders, and I'm, I'm developing a program to work with them. And so I find that it's difficult that I've grown my my contacts in order to give me a greater reach but still find that it seems like people don't really read your posts or uh, and same on Facebook quite often uh, I feel like that I don't really get much traction even though people are generally quite interested in what I'm trying to to, to show them so I'm I wonder if you've got any advice for me on those platforms for sure. And it actually has nothing to do with the specific platform, which is really interesting. Um, anytime that I put out a message, and by the way, this happens to me a lot, <laughs> more than I even want to admit, I'll put out a message that I really believe in and I'll put it out there and it'll get like seven likes. And I'll be like, I have 300,000 followers on this platform. How did it get seven likes? And then the beautiful humility check hits me. <gasps> oh, I didn't communicate in a way that speaks to the person that this is meant to hit. And so I'll actually take that, that piece of content um, and rework it and post it again in a week or in a month, but totally reworked to meet my people where they're at. Because if I believe in it, I can still believe in that same message. 
Um, but there's a book that really helped me with understanding how to rework my messaging to make sure it was always meeting my people where they're at. And that is Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And a lot of people think that this just has to do with building a brand, but this has everything to do with the messaging we use on social media. And by the way, you're not the only one, like I said, I, I do this all the time. I'll put out a video and I'll be like, oh, that was so awesome. And then like an hour later, I'll be like, yeah, that really wasn't that good. <laughs> Because the numbers just show me like it's a reflection of did I take the time to reach my people with either education, entertainment, emotion, engagement? Did I really connect with them or empathize with where they're at? Okay, thank you. Uh, so it's, it's me, not them. <laughs> yeah, and it's me, it's us, right? <laughs> and so the other thing I wanted to ask was so, with that audience in mind, TikTok? I mean, it seems unlikely that they, but from what you're saying is perhaps, perhaps they are interested in that platform or, you know, perhaps they do look at TikTok. Oh my gosh. The beautiful thing about TikTok is that if you are not, okay, ready for this? This is my reminder to myself. If you're not the best at dancing, if you're not the funniest, if you're not the smartest, if you're not the cutest, you may discount this platform because let me just tell you, there's a lot of 21 year old girls on this platform that look a lot better in a bikini and can dance really well. And I can't dance and I'm not wearing a bikini. So it's easy for us all to be like, well, it's not going to work for me. But the truth is when we look different than the superlatives, mm -hmm. we stand out in a good way and draw people who are more like us to say, I want to learn from this person. I feel safe here. I don't feel like I have to worry about, you know, if this person's uh, bikini is going to stay in place while they're dancing, right? Like they're like, thank you so much for what you bring to this platform because it does stand out when someone comes in with wisdom or maturity or experience or education or value or empathy. Okay. You've inspired me to give it a go now. <laughs> I'm so excited for you. I'm going to record a TikTok video as soon as I finish the interview as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And I also just wanted to say on showing your uh, postpartum belly, I just think that's a really great thing to do because I, I think one of the things I got from um, having my children was just like the shock of, you know, getting to grips with that's, that's how it's going to go because no one's is that real. And a friend of mine recently um, had twins that went to term. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's extraordinary but she took a photo like every i don't know every week and so you see this happening and now she's taking it you know as the belly's going down i just think for people who haven't ever been pregnant that's you know that's a good to know really so i i think well done for doing that because some you know you will have helped lots of people who would have otherwise had a horrible shock when it happens to them yeah. And that was what I went through and I was like, I, I don't want the next wave of mamas to feel that over the next 10 or 20 years. If I don't want the first time that they see that to be when they look down at their stomach after having a baby, because it's yeah. shocking. Yeah. And there's <laughs> enough shock going on at that time anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Caroline. And... All right, Rachel, it's time to wrap up the interview. Definitely, definitely like gold from the start of the interview till the end. Uh, if someone wants to reach out to you or to work with you, what, what are the best ways? Easiest place to find me is on my website, rachelpeterson.com. All E's and a D in my last name. And my uh, social media platforms are all at the Mrs. Peterson, all E's and a D in my last name. Uh, that's brilliant. All the social media details uh, are going to be and the links of the website are in the show notes. So make sure you check them out. Uh, reach out to Rachel. And if there is something that uh, stood out, uh, maybe you listen to this interview and something really stood out for you and you want to thank Rachel or you want to share with her what, uh, what you learned and what impact this interview made, then of course, uh, let her know. Let me know as well, because I'd uh, love to know the impact that this podcast makes. Uh, having said that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Thank you, Mercy, as well, for being a part of this uh, interview and adding this extra layer of interaction. Uh, I, like, I like doing podcast interviews with clients. This is something to keep. I'm definitely doing more of this. 
And having said that, for everyone watching or listening, looking forward to seeing you next time. And always remember that together we grow exponentially. Ciao.